Howdy, folks. This is Mackenzie DeLulo, Senior Editor at The Texan. Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Impeachment, Paxton on Trial. Today, attorneys in the impeachment trial questioned Brandon Kamek for most of the day. The special counselor Paxton retained on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General to investigate the complaints of Austin real estate developer Nate Paul against federal authorities. Toward the end of the day, some additional witnesses were called to testify, including Joe Brown, who testified about applying for the special counsel job, Kendall Garrison, CEO of Amplify Credit Union, and Darren McCarty, a former employee of the OAG. Here's a recap. The proceedings started about an hour late. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said that the chamber was ready on time, but that the legal teams had an issue to work out before the proceedings began. Brandon Kamick, who got married a week ago and has yet to honeymoon due to the trial, testified that he was hired by Paxton himself to serve as outside counsel for the OAG. He said the attorney general said he wanted to hire a special prosecutor to investigate potential violations of the Texas Penal Code. Kamek was recommended to Paxton by Michael Wynn, Nate Paul's lawyer. He said he was excited and flattered to be working with the OAG. The only person I reported to was Mr. Paxton, said Kamek when asked about the allegations that he was working for the Travis County District Attorney's Office. He said he primarily communicated with Paxton via an encrypted messaging app and Proton email addresses. Kamek, who issued over 30 grand jury subpoenas in his investigation to evaluate Paul's allegations against federal authorities, said he got the list of names to be subpoenaed from Wynn and Paul. He said he had never issued a grand jury subpoena at the time. Per Kamek, U.S. Marshals showed up at his law office in Houston after he questioned a judge about his deceased wife in his investigation. Kamek voiced his concerns to Paxton and Brent Webster, the first assistant attorney general who replaced Jeff Mateer at a meeting at a Starbucks in Austin. He testified that Webster informed him there that his contract with the agency was null and void and that he would not be paid for his work. Paxton's defense pushed back against the line of questioning that asserted Kamek was naive and inexperienced in his role with the OAG. Kamek insisted that he never thought he was investigating a baseless allegation and said that Paxton did not pressure him to reach a particular conclusion. He testified that he was not trying to help or hurt Paul, allegations outlined in one of the articles of impeachment. The Houston-based lawyer testified that I have never got any pushback from anyone at the Attorney General's office or the Travis County District Attorney's office until he received a cease and desist letter from Mateer, the OAG's first assistant Attorney General at the time. Enjoy this episode. Howdy folks, Mackenzie DeLulo here, and we are on day six of the impeachment trial of suspended Attorney General Ken Paxton in the Texas Senate. I'm joined today by Brad Johnson and Matt Stringer to discuss the proceedings of today. Lots to talk about as always. And today we are joined by a very special guest, Republican strategist Brendan Steinhauser. Brendan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. We're so excited to have you join us. And I want to real quick before we dive into the details of today, I want to hear your perspective on the trial so far. You've been in and around Texas politics for a long time and have a lot of insight to share with our listeners. So tell us what's stood out to you. What's your insight on the arguments from the House Board of Managers and Paxton's defense? How generally do you think things are shaping up so far? Yeah, well, the, the first reaction to that is this is really fascinating as someone who loves Texas, loves Texas history and Texas politics. We haven't had a scenario like this in a very long time. And the only thing really similar is the impeachment of uh, Paul Ferguson, the governor from, I guess, the 1920s or so. And so there's not a lot to really fall back on in terms of the procedures and the rules and kind of uh, what history may suggest about what is happening with this trial. So it's been really kind of interesting from that perspective, whether you're a reporter or a senator or a staffer or an operative watching this or a, a member of the general public not really knowing you know what to expect and how it's all going to play out in terms of the the order the rules the procedures the processes and of course public opinion i think that's been a, a big wild card as well because everyone says this isn't you know supposed to be political but we all know that politics informs this process just like everything else and it's going to play a, a big role 
So I kind of start there and say it's it's really just fascinating from that perspective. Um, it's been so far, you know, pretty interesting. Not a lot of big surprises. I think the the Paxton defense team uh, has really done a pretty good job, actually, trying to make their case, trying to wave off the uh, the charges uh, that led to the impeachment. I think overall, people would say they've probably exceeded some expectations because there's been a lot out in the public domain about the various criminal trials, about you know Paxton's uh, relationship with Nate Paul, all the sordid details of his affair and and those sorts of things. And so I think in in some ways, um, I think his defense team has done a pretty good job and I think they probably earned their paycheck so far. Um, time will tell. Uh, I think it's very hard to get a read on how the senators are actually consuming this information, what they're thinking about, what they're hearing. You know, there is a high bar to vote to convict. And so uh, both in terms of the evidence and in terms of the numbers that it requires. And so it's really hard to get a sense of what they're thinking or what they're doing, because obviously they're under a gag order. Um, but we're all really watching to see how this thing is going to end up when it wraps up pretty soon. And we're hearing it maybe as soon as this weekend or maybe sometime early next week. Um, but this is one of those rare instances in politics where it is really completely unpredictable. It's it's hard to know how this is going to go. And it really could go either way at the end of the day. I love hearing you talk about not knowing how the senators are responding to this in any way right now. I cannot be the only one who's watching the live stream and very meticulously looking for some sort of reaction or facial expression from the senators. And I just haven't seen much at all. I mean, there have been, we've talked about it on the podcast a little bit, you know, you catch a senator putting eye drops in their eye or something like that. But really, there has been no indication of where, you know, folks land just based on watching them react to testimony. So there's just a lot of unknowns there. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about yesterday. We recorded before a couple of folks took to the stand as witnesses, both former uh, Travis County District Attorney Margaret Moore and former uh, District Attorney employee Greg Cox both took the stand after we recorded. Um, Greg Cox was a former employee of the Travis County District Attorney's Office and was asked by the prosecution to describe potential crimes that Paxton may have committed while in office. And then the defense came forward and brought forward the fact that he had applied for a job with the OAG after writing that memo that outlined Paxton's potential crimes. Margaret Moore said that she sent the referral for Paul's case back to David Maxwell, which was, in her words, an attempt to find a delicate way of declining to investigate due to her working relationship with Paxton. Um, she denied that the Democrat-led Travis County DA's office was, quote, excited about the case against the Attorney General, saying in response to the defense I can't speak for the entire office, but I was not excited about any of this. Matt, any thoughts on that last bit of testimony from last night? Well, I think you summarized the occurrences of yesterday pretty well uh, with Cox, um, the defense, Busby in particular, uh, on cross-examination. Uh, made the first appearance of a uh, ham sandwich in the uh trial so to speak and <laughs> in and asking cox if he's ever heard this saying you can indict a hand sandwich uh and the point to that was that uh cox had testified to all these things you know you could you know paxton could potentially be charged with and busby's counterpoint was well you know if prosecutor wants to charge you with something he can just charge you with something you know and then started questioning the appropriateness of cox's testimony in a legal context you know and saying you know if this was a regular trial would you be allowed to say that in here no you would not be able to come in here and say well you know paxton could have done this this and you know speculate uh, the way he did so poking a lot of holes in that testimony and then his former boss took the sand, Margaret Moore, the former Travis County District Attorney. And uh, you saw the defense witness after witness really uh, invoke a defense uh, on Paxton's part as his motivation for appointing the special counsel and saying it wasn't entirely, you know, his his call alone that the Travis County District Attorney had done this referral. 
And so the prosecution went down the rabbit hole on that. And, and, you know, she admitted, yes, we, I sent this referral or whatever she called it over to David Maxwell at the attorney general's office, but with the clear intent that it go nowhere, that he not do anything with it, that, that, you know, basically she's very bluntly described on the stand that I was essentially giving him lip service and I was like, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll look into this. We'll send a referral, all that sort of stuff and intending for it to dead end. With the assumption that she said, or she said that she had the assumption as well that Maxwell would regard the case the same way she did. Yes, absolutely. Pretty fascinating stuff. Okay. Well, that was a little bit of last night. We'll go ahead and jump into today. We've had one witness primarily on the stand for most of the day, Brandon Com- Camac, Camac. Camac, yeah. I don't know. Well, this name has been said in four different ways throughout the That's trial, true. and I have had a, a very hard time saying it correctly today. Camac. Um, but Brad, why don't you go ahead and give us a quick rundown of the prosecution's questioning of Camac? So we've heard a lot about Camac throughout this process. Um, he is central to the allegations against Paxton as the hired prosecutor, special prosecutor, to evaluate Nate Paul's case against the FBI and how the agency handled its investigation and raid of his office in relation to the Mitty Foundation suit. Um, He's named specifically, Kamak is, in Article 5. Um, Kamak testified that he understood his duty in the Paul matter was to prepare a report and submit his findings to Paxton for any action the Attorney General chose to take. He was asked by... Paxton to see if the FBI violated any state laws when it uh, searched his searched his office, um, any altering of the original search warrant, things like that. Uh, according to Camac, uh, Paxton used a Proton email and messaging app Signal to communicate with him throughout the investigation. Signal's an encrypted messaging app used by, honestly, a lot of folks in politics, but it was notable. Yeah, and it's especially useful for being able to automatically delete messages. Um, It's very, uh, it's high priority is is privacy and security. Um, He, KMAC signed a a contract with the Attorney General uh, worth $300 per hour and was tasked with investigating this. During it, he served over 30 grand jury subpoenas. Among those subpoenas was opposing counsel in the Mitty Foundation case. In fact, that Kamak said, I'm getting it, I'm screwing it up. Now too, <laughs> I'm messing you up. Said he was unaware of and um, he, they were included on the suggested list of subpoenas, people to be subpoenaed by Nate Paul and his attorney, Michael Wynn. That was something asked by the prosecution. If he knew that, would he have served them subpoenas? And he said no. Yeah, that was a very striking moment. Yeah. And throughout this whole situation, throughout the whole questioning, the prosecution was trying to uh, illustrate him as kind of a novice. He was a, a young attorney. I think he'd been in the profession for five years. He said on the stand that he had never, um, he had never served, uh, issued a grand jury subpoena before, and he took a lot of advice from Michael Wynn, Nate Paul's attorney, throughout this process. And so he detailed further, um, further discussions and actions with the attorney general and his team, uh, and then Nate Paul and Michael Wynn. Um, overall, the prosecution asserted that Paxton cooked up an investigation into faulty actions by the FBI to run cover for Paul and rope this guy, uh, this newbie into the whole situation. And he was none the wiser. Um, One, one thing that stuck out to me during the Kamek cross examination by the prosecution was he was asked, um, did you let when go with you to serve? these subpoenas. And he said, yes, I did. And he's like, were you aware or did he tell you about the law that that prohibits him from going with you while serving this? He's like, no, I was not aware of that. And nor was I made aware. You know, I I guess I think he said, nor was I was I made aware by the AG's office um, sort of as providing guidance on how to do his job. Um, 
And uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, point that, 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 that arose uh, with, with Wynn inserting himself into going along. And he said that he felt pressured. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they said, could you describe that pressure? And he said, well, I felt like it was pressure to do a good job, uh, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, all this, this investigation continued until things kind of came to a head when Jeff Mateer, the first witness that was called the former first assistant attorney general and the first whistleblower on these allegations against the attorney general, uh, sent KMAC a cease and desist letter, um, which eventually started the snowball rolling towards this contract between the attorney general's office, Paxton, and this um, Houston attorney to be canceled. And um, it also included an event where uh, U.S. Marshals showed up to Kamak's office unannounced. Kamak had no idea it was happening. He didn't know what was going on. He testified. Um, he said, you know, I'm, I'm getting these cease and desist letters and then federal investigators are showing up to my office. What is happening? And uh, it eventually ended up turn um, uh, culminated in this meeting, this weird story that he told um, of a meeting between himself, Paxton and Webster at a Starbucks where they canceled his contract, told him he would receive no payment for the work that had already been done and then almost left him there without his car. They took him from the office. They drove there together from yes. the office and almost left him there after they canceled or they said that the contract was null and void. Yes. And so um, overall, as the prosecution's kind of painting the picture here, they asked him um, if Paxton apologized to this guy for, quote, pulling the rug out from under him. Kamek said no. Yeah. Wild, wild story. So, Brendan, as you're hearing this testimony, um, as Kamek is being questioned by the House Board of Managers team, what were your takeaways today? Well, I think that, you know, an objective observer has to see uh, with Kamek's testimony that it does appear that, you know, the attorney general was asking for kind of special treatment and favors for Nate Paul. Um, that seems pretty clear from that testimony. And that is one of the, the key um, pieces of the the charges brought against the attorney general, right? So, you know, it, it, he does make a case there that there was some, some irregularities, some odd things like having Paul's lawyer go with him to serve the subpoenas and that sort of thing. So that's one reaction. And then I think the other thing is there was a lot of sympathy probably for Kimmick getting roped into this situation that he probably had no idea what he was getting into. He talked about how he was just there to, I think, to learn and and grow. And it was kind of a career opportunity for him. And now he feels like he got dragged into this thing and uh, doesn't know, you know, if he can ever kind of get out and clear his name, so to speak. Um, so it was kind of a, a tough situation for him. But again, I think what the prosecution is trying to do here is to say, here is yet another example of uh, the behaviors that they're alleging, right? That the uh, Attorney General Paxton used his office in ways that were inappropriate, illegal, et cetera. And so I thought this was an important part of the case for the prosecution. It's going to be very interesting to see um, where the senators eventually come down on this particular count. And to your point, Brendan, they, you know, the prosecution did make a point of saying, okay, how did you feel about being contracted by the office of the attorney general? You know, you're a new lawyer. You've been practicing for five years. You're approached by the attorney general's office to do work for the top lawyer, the top law enforcement officer in the state. And he said he was, what were his words? He was like, I'm flattered. I was excited. Like he, at one point, um, lawyers were questioning him about appearing at a press conference with Paxton. And he got this little grin on his face. Like very obviously this was a huge opportunity for him. And, I think it does go also to show that these whistleblowers who did work in the office of the attorney general held very coveted spots in legal in legal circles here in Texas. Um, Working at the attorney general's office is uh, certainly prestigious in many ways. And this was a huge, to your point, Brendan, a career opportunity um, for Kamek. So certainly a big part of the prosecution's argument here is that, yes, this was a big opportunity. He was paid $300 an hour. Um, He was doing a lot of work. And 
you know, I think in his initial interview with Paxton, which lasted what, like 15, 20 minutes, it wasn't that long. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how long that first one at the office, he met with Paxton, he went around and uh, Paxton introduced him to Mateer. Mm -hmm. He said Mateer was disengaged is how he referred to it and like disengaged with the work that I would be doing, um, which kind of falls in line with Matir's testimony of being very apprehensive about this outside contract being brought into the attorney general's office. Um, so very fascinating testimony. Yeah, it was a, he had a lot to say, a lot of details to provide. Um, and then on the cross, he can, they, they kind of tinkered at the edges. They tried to, um, uh, assert that he was not this inexperienced, naive guy. Um, he was hired for a specific reason, a reason that at least for the, the most of the stretch of this investigation, he was conducting, like he, he, um, was fulfilling the, the goal of what, uh, what it was his assignment was. And so, um, he, the, the defense attorney, Dan Cogdell also, uh, tried to, as he has done, the defense has done throughout this home in on a, an article in the specific language of the article and try and um, show how it was errantly written. Uh, we saw it on the first two articles, the charitable trust, um, the second one about the midnight opinion. This one, he asked uh, Kamak about the language baseless allegations in this article, the fact, the, the assertion that Kamak was hired to, um, investigate these baseless allegations that Paul made, he was asked, uh, did the prosecution ever ask you about whether you thought these were baseless allegations? And he said, no, they did not. And they further pressed him on whether he thinks investigating the FBI is an illegitimate, um, evaluation. Like can, can a state officer legitimately look into FBI, uh, malfeasance? And he said, yes, they can. I don't think it's the FBI's above reproach on this subject, that kind of thing. Um, and then he talked about how he never got any pushback from the attorney general's office or the Travis County DA's office for doing what he was doing until Mateer sent him the cease and desist letter. So, so he was kind of blind to the stakes of what was going on. It was his testimony. Uh, at least nobody clued him in on concerns they had in the background. Um, what you mentioned, Mateer being apprehensive, but he didn't say specifically that, you know, this is not something I would like you doing. Right. Um, well, it sounded like he had very little communication with the attorney general's right. office and the staff themselves. He was, he repeatedly said he reported directly to attorney general Ken Paxton. Yes. Um, Brendan, when you look at this and you were talking earlier about, of course, the articles of impeachment being completely central to all of this, when you see Paxton's defense, get up there, read the article of impeachment regarding Kamek and ask, okay, were you an attorney pro tem? And he said, no. Do you think you were investigating in a baseless complaint? No. Were you trying to benefit Nate Paul? Absolutely not. Obviously, the defense is going up there and trying to refute the claims in the allegations. And yet you do have the testimony when he was questioned by the prosecution saying, OK, well, Michael Wynn did come with me to issue some of these subpoenas. And, you know, there are all these different instances of, like you said, irregularities in your mind when you hear both sides. Where does this come down on that article of impeachment? Well, that is a good question. And, and I would say that, you know, it seems to me that Kimmick is somewhat covering his own self. Let me put it that way. Um, I think he's concerned about, you know, how he might get, I don't know, caught up in all of this and probably has some reputational concerns and legal concerns and, and all sorts of things. So of course I could see that body language saying, you know, I was doing what I thought was right and I didn't do anything improper. And so in some ways he might, that might be coloring his perception of kind of what happened. And he's trying to color the perception of the jurors here, the senators, um, to kind of convince them that, you know, at least he did nothing uh, to his knowledge that was improper. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily prevents it from being true that the intent of, you know, the, the attorney general was to provide some uh, improper use of the, the office to pr you know provide support to and, and carry out the wishes of, of Nate Paul. So that's I think that the senators will 
look to that as the crux of the issue, um, regardless of what Kamek said about kind of his perception of, of what he did and, and whether it was, um, you know, appropriate or not. So that's kind of my take on that particular count. But I, I think that it did come across to me that it's, it's a pattern that the prosecution is trying to lay out a pattern of, you know, the AG using the office to benefit this one particular individual who, you know, really, the, you know, stands out. And I think what's interesting about all of this too, is like the fact that, you know, people keep referring to that donation. Well, any of us who know Texas politics well, and who've worked in Texas politics, look at a $25,000 donation and say, okay, that's big comparatively speaking to other states or to other places. But in Texas, a statewide elected official, they often get six figure checks and sometimes seven figure checks. And so it is a little odd. Um, you know, there had to be something else more than just the donation itself. So I think they're, they're trying to peel away those layers uh, to get at what was the nature of this relationship? What else is there between, you know, Paxton and, and Paul? And so that's what you're seeing with, with some of these other things. Um, but it is, it is interesting and it's very hard to predict how each individual senator is going to, you know, come down on this. And, and we've seen the, the defense constantly um, uh, home in on specific actions, whether it's the opinion, whether it's hiring a special prosecutor, any of this stuff and saying, well, is that, is that something that the attorney general is not allowed to do? And most of the time the answer is no, the attorney general is within his realm of responsibilities, even if it might be unusual an unusual action for him to take. Um, Which is why then abuse of office becomes such an important term to define. And when you have a room full of senators who are all holding public office, their perspective is very different right. from a regular jury. Right. And bribery, uh, bribery and abuse of office have kind of gone hand in hand during this, but they're two very different charges. One is very specific bribery. Abuse of office is a lot broader and It'd be, a, it'd be a lot easier to prove by the prosecution, whether they have or not. It's a different question, but um, that's that's why they're focusing on on this aspect more than anything else, I think. And to Brendan's uh, point, I mean, I think the prosecution is trying to lay out the case as best they can and showing that, yes. And Cam, it, it from all testimony and accounts, it seems as though he was a... Um, willing participant, but a very unwilling participant in what it turned out to actually what, what the, you know, uh, alleged intent behind this investigation turned out to be. He didn't, he was, you know, in above his head, didn't quite know what was going on, saw it as a career opportunity to work with the office of the attorney general, but had no malintent himself. That's what it appears to be at this point. Um, and unwitting. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and so when you're looking at this as well, it's easy for the defense to come in and say and ask those questions um, because, you know, the prosecution is trying to lay out the point of the, you know, Ken Paxton hired a naive, inexperienced person to come and carry these things out on behalf of himself and Nate Paul. But he was naive and inexperienced, so he didn't know. And so he can get up there and be questioned by the defense. You know, at any point, did Ken Paxton ask you to mis- misrepresent the facts? No. Did you have any intent to help or hurt Nate Paul? No. And he can answer those questions very truthfully. Um, so we'll see what happens there. I'm very curious to know, you know, how this actually ends up. And I'd be so I'd pay money to be inside one a few of these senators brains right now and <laughs> how they're perceiving all of this. Um, yeah, we'll see what ends up happening. Brendan, any additional thoughts on the defense's line of questioning? Well, I was going to say, actually, you know, your your point on being in the brains of the senators is, is kind of a fun one, because I think a lot of times people just think that they know exactly what those folks are thinking. Right. It's so clear that they must be thinking this. They must be thinking that. And I've, I've had been in a lot of those conversations where they absolutely don't know what they're going to do. They don't know what they're thinking. They're asking everybody for opinions and advice, um, trying to figure out what the right thing to do is the right thing legally, morally, ethically, uh, constitutionally, and politically. And that's hard. Those things don't always line up. And so for me, it's, I have to kind of chuckle a little bit because right now, because of the gag order and because of the limitations on what they can really say, they don't have they don't have those sounding boards, those outside sounding boards in particular, outside of the bubble, to really ask people what their opinions are. They have to rely on what they can collect just kind of in the public sphere. So I think this is one of those cases where, again, it's, it's more interesting because they're trying to wade through all of this and make a, a calculation that's going to be imperfect as to how to vote. And um, there's certainly pressure coming from different sides, political pressure, 
from Paxton and his allies, you know, pressure from uh, other folks who were saying, you know, we want you to convict. So it's really kind of an interesting and fascinating study in how uh, policymakers make decisions. And uh, this will be one for the the political science professors and historians to study for a long time. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Then I'm very curious, Brendan, to hear your perspective on day one as senators for the first time, we're taking votes and kind of showing a little bit of their cards um, on those motions right up front. We have obviously the gag order prevented them from, you know, talking about any of this in, a, in the public sphere. And even prior to the gag order, they, a lot of them had issued statements saying, I'm, you know, I'm just ready for a, a fair trial. I'm, I'm not going to be issuing any statements are commenting on what's gone on um, after the House's vote to impeach. So I'm curious, were there any big surprises for you when those senators did vote for different motions on day one? It's a good question. I was a little surprised how few senators voted to say, um, you know, we want to just dismiss these completely, right? I, that was a very low number. Um, I was a little surprised. I thought it might be a little higher, but you know, I, I think the final votes can be quite different and we shouldn't read too much into that. It, it, and part of me is thinking too back to the federal side where in the U.S. Senate you have the cloture vote, which is where you need 60 votes to end debate and go to the final vote. And uh, senators in Washington are notorious for voting yes on cloture and no on the final bill so they can have their cake and eat it too. And so you might see that scenario play out as well. Um, yes, we voted to allow the, the, this to proceed. We heard all the evidence and then we voted um, to acquit essentially because the, the evidence wasn't there and it allows them to kind of have it both ways in some in some aspects. So I thought about that as a, a, an apt comparison to kind of keep in mind as we watch this process play out. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Matt, in terms of the defense and the prosecutor, just Kamek's quite like questioning today. Did you have any final thoughts on how it all went down? Well, it's um, once again, it's it's difficult to uh, determine what kind of impact it had on the jury. And I, I think that's just um, uh, I just keep thinking about back to the beginning of all this uh, whenever everybody kind of raised their eyebrows and thought, well, what kind of trial and court are you going to have, you know, with a bunch of politicians, you know, making the decisions and overseeing it. But you're seeing a lot of praise um, from across the spectrum for how Lieutenant Governor Patrick has got to play judge and the fairness that he's he's provided in the process. And I think the fact that everybody is really questioning, wondering, you know, what the senators are thinking and everything like that. Um, it's it's how anybody would um, would think in, in any trial, uh, you know, that's that's um, doesn't have a political thumb on one of the scales. So, um I think, uh, you know, and, and, and also I, I've thought about this, um, when it's over, uh, the senators will have to explain their rationale and their votes and, and, um, whatever their decision is going to be, there's going to be a lot of parties, constituents as well, you know, who want a good explanation on one what way they or another, decide, one way or the other. Um, so I, I don't think you're going to see any, uh, shoot from the hip explanations. I think that they're all taking it very seriously. And, um, I, I think it's, I think it's just like any trial would be, uh, which is an interesting thing. Like as you said, for the, for the political science professors to study. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, it's it's just after after today's um, it's it's still quite the nail biter in my view. Yeah. As of this morning, I believe the defense had maybe three more hours than the prosecution did of time left in the trial. So we'll see how that also wrap, wraps up. I'm curious, um, you know, Brendan, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, I think, has done a very good and tactful job of finding a way to um, not really tick off any of the major stakeholders that might um, have issues with how the trial is run. Um, you see, you know, the very pro-Paxton 
side ardently defending him on social media. You see folks who very much want to see Paxton go down and are convinced he's guilty on all counts. And somehow it seems the lieutenant governor has found a way to kind of weave his way into conducting the trial and not having at least a horde of criticism launched his way. I'm curious if you have any any perspective on that. Yeah, I think that's a really good observation. Um, he, he has always had his foot in a little bit of both camps in the Republican Party, kind of the, the more kind of Tea Party conservative grassroots wing and kind of the more mainstream Republican. Some would, would say establishment Republican as well. And um, on, on most issues, he's very conservative and leads a very conservative Senate and agenda. I think by all of all accounts, people would agree with that. Um, but he's in a, a tough position politically because of just the nature of the Republican primary voters in Texas and what their opinion is on this matter, which is still moving and still, um, you know, somewhat in, in question among some folks. But Paxton still has a lot of support in the base and the grassroots. And so I think uh, Patrick is aware of that. But I, I agree. I think he's done a real masterful, masterful job of, um, as you said, weaving through that and um, has managed to not uh, alienate one side or the other. I, I find it kind of fun and, and uh, comical to watch him have to decide whether or not to sustain or overrule objections from the attorneys. Now, that is my favorite part of the trial so far, uh, just to watch him uh, do that. So I, I've really enjoyed that. And I'm, I'm sure this is... Uh, not as fun for him as it is fun for me to watch that happen. <laughs> That's a great point too. The stakes are much higher for the Lieutenant Governor and then us watching at home and picking apart everything that's happening. So folks, since we've been recording um, or preparing to record in the last hour, there have been three more witnesses who have gone to the stand. Joe Brown is one of them who, Brad, correct me if I'm wrong, but and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was the first choice of the Office of the Attorney General to hold Brandon Camax. Uh, role. Special yeah, he was Special a surprise. former Grayson County District Attorney and then was was nominated by both Texas Senators and President Trump and confirmed by the Senate to be a U.S. attorney during the Trump administration. There you go. And then, oh yeah, Brad, you said no, that. Okay. Else. No, and, then, and yeah, as as uh, as you said, he was he was one of two people. Brandon Kamick. uh was was the other one who ultimately got the job, so to speak, uh, for that outside special counsel, whatever, whatever that title really was. I'm yeah. not entirely special clear. Special prosecutor is what Kamek today testified that Paxton called it in yeah. interviews. Uh, and, and ultimately, um, you know, even though Brandon Kamek uh, was a much newer, so to speak, attorney, uh, uh, um, Kamek still got the job. Yeah. So, and then the next witness was Kendall Garrison, the CEO of Amplify Credit Union. Um, Brad, do you have any idea of what her testimony entailed? Uh, discussing how the bank reacted to the midnight opinion and, and whether they adjusted their operations because of it, how they decided to hold foreclosure auctions or whether even to hold them at all. Uh, it looks like from, from Twitter that they reacted to it uh, in a way that would benefit the prosecution case that you know this thing affected policy um but yeah that's what that was it was pretty quick testimony i think yeah there you go and then the next witness who just took the stand a few moments ago is darren mccarty one of the oag's employees who resigned he was not one of those who joined the whistleblower lawsuit but if you've been listening to testimony for the last few days particularly from the other former employees and some of the whistleblowers you've heard his name quite often so i'm interested to hear his testimony brendan thank you so much for joining us i'd love to hear you know any perspective you have on what we should be looking for this week as the trial all starts to wrap up. Yeah, I think uh, we'll just continue to, you know, try and pay attention to the the closing arguments, even though the, the official closing arguments are an hour long or so and, and coming later. But as the prosecution starts to wind up its case and head toward the conclusion to the end of the week, just to see if there is um, what I would call kind of a smoking gun. And I think so far, I haven't seen that just yet. I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, strong arguments here and there. Um, some evidence that they've put forward. I think the, the the witnesses are credible and I think believable to the senators. But I think one thing a lot of folks are 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 seeing is that there hasn't really been that that big moment, that big reveal of something so uh, striking or so um, I don't know shocking that it's going to tip this thing. So maybe that's coming, maybe not. Um, but if it is coming, the prosecution has you know has to do that here, and it's 
final few days. And if they don't have that kind of uh, evidence, they don't have kind of a bombshell, then I think this goes right down to the wire and this really could go either way. And as I said at the beginning of the, the podcast, I think the defense team's done a pretty good job trying to raise doubts, trying to bat away these arguments, you know, trying to say that you may not like some of, you know, this or that, um, but, but raising questions as to whether um, these behaviors meet the standard, the high standard that would lead to a conviction in this case. And so uh, we'll watch for, for how the prosecution wraps up its case and how the defense is able to continue to, uh, to play defense. Absolutely. And as a reminder for folks as well, there are 20 articles of impeachment. I believe 16 total are being considered currently or 17, 16, 16. Um, and so those each individual article will be voted on by senators as well. And it only takes one article to be voted on, um, with two thirds for, um, conviction to happen in the Senate. So we'll be watching that very closely. And it's also why we're looking very closely at the individual articles is because those votes will be individual. Gentlemen, I so appreciate you joining me today. Brendan, we so appreciate your time. Thank you for joining our little podcast today. Folks, thank you for listening and we will catch you on the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to Inside the Impeachment, Paxton on Trial. For access to all of our team's coverage on this historic proceeding, visit thetexan.news and subscribe today.